Okay, gentlemen, talking about complex numbers today. So uh, some of you saw this briefly in class, some not at all. Um, so just to kind of start from the beginning, imaginary roots are roots or solutions or zeros that do not touch the x-axis. Imaginary meaning they do not cross the x-axis. There are no x-intercepts. So for example, if I were to graph this equation, this function right here, it would be, if we graph it in Desmos, it would be a parabola x squared, except it would just be raised up by 1. The plus 1 means it crosses the y-axis at 1, right? It's like the plus b in mx plus b. The c value is using our y-intercept, and we can see that right here. It crosses at 1, but it never crosses the x-axis. Stuff like this x squared plus numbers usually for us meant we couldn't factor it any further because it yielded imaginary roots. Now that we're talking about imaginary roots, we can kind of learn how to deal with them so we can better find solutions to equations like this or functions like this. So we know imaginary roots are ones where there are a negative in the radical. We start by defining i to be negative 1. So literally just a negative in the radical can come out as an i. So if I do a little side note to the side, square root of 49, we know that would just be 7. If I were to give you the same problem except make it a negative 49, essentially what's happening behind the scenes is there's a negative 1 in there and then there's the 49. So we can break up the 49, negative 49 into a negative 1 and a positive 49. As stated here, the negative 1 inside a radical comes out as an i. And now I'm just left with radical 49, which we know that to be very simply 7. So the only difference between these two problems is when I see a negative, take it out as an i. And these are for even indices, so squares and fourths. Most of the time we'll see it as squared, so index of 2 for now. If I just do two examples to the side, negative 25, without having to do any work really, 5i. Square root of 25 is 5. The negative in the radical comes out as an i. Okay, and that's what this means. We must memorize that. Over here, radical 20, if I were to break this up, just like I did up above, essentially this is a negative 1, a 4, and a 5. These are the exact factors of it. I know the 4 is going to come out as a 2. The 5 I know cannot come out, so the 5 stays. The 4 comes out as a 2. The negative 1 comes out as an i. And normally we write this i outside like here. We don't really write it after the radical 5. One, because it looks a little bit like, is it under the radical, is it not? This just looks a little bit neater. And if the i is coming out of the radical, we kind of want to write it in front of it. Okay? So that's a little bit about kind of simplifying with i. Okay, now we'll move to some cool patterns that occur, cool to me and Mr. Fitz, but that occur with i. So we know i is equal to square root of negative 1. That's a property we're going to have to have memorized and always know. i squared to us means I take i, which is radical negative 1, and I times it by itself, radical negative 1. We know that anything times itself, in other words, anything squared, that's a radical, any radical squared, they cancel each other out. The squared cancels the radical. So this and this will cancel, leaving me with just a negative 1. That fact is probably the second, maybe even the most important thing from here. Having an imaginary number, 3i, 4i, 5i, whatever, and you square that whole thing, it's going to come out to be a real number, a, not only real, but a rational number of 1. And that's why something like this that looks so ordinary can come out to imaginary roots. And this is kind of why, going backwards, if I have something that's imaginary and we square it, it comes out as a real number. Very, very, very useful, especially when we're dealing with quadratics, as we do most of the time. x to the third, well, that would be i squared times i, right? We can kind of break it up 
as i squared times i. Why am I choosing to break it up by i squared? Well, i squared is so nice to us, it comes out as just a negative 1. We know i, we can't really do much with the i, so if I leave it as i, kind of a weird fact, i to the third, the i squared inside of it comes out as a negative 1 from the above fact we just learned. And then I'm just left with a single i. So i to the third gets me negative i. Kind of weird. So 2i to the third is the same as 2i. That's negative. Interesting. i to the fourth is i squared times i squared. Again, why am I choosing i squared? Well, that's our, that's our golden one. i squared gets me negative 1. And wait a second, negative 1 times negative 1, that's just positive 1. This one is probably the second most useful thing, but again, that really comes from this i squared property, which is extremely useful. So again, 2i, I'll do this in green to stay consistent, 2i to the 4th is just 2. Crazy. 2i to the 4th comes out as just a 2. Just to go up here, 2i squared would just be negative 2. Keeping in mind a fact we learned a while ago, once you start putting things in parentheses, this would change a little bit. You would get 4i squared, so you would get negative 4. But that's kind of like a side note. Just be careful with your parentheses here, right? Only things being squared, cubed, and fourthed here are the i's, which is very interesting. And now once you get to i to the fifth, well, that's just i to the fourth. I'm choosing that because that's just 1 times i, which would give me 1 times i, which is just i. The reason we show i to the fifth is after i to the fifth, I go back to the beginning, i. At i to the fifth, I go back to the beginning. i to the sixth would be just like this. It would come out as a negative 1 because it'd be i to the fifth times i, which would be negative 1. So we have a nice little chart here. That I chart. And the important things from here are, well, we know I is equal to radical negative 1. That's vital. I squared is negative 1. I to the third is negative I. And I to the fourth is 1. And this will repeat itself every four times. So for example, I to the first, I to the second, I to the third, I to the fourth. I to the fifth is up here. I to the sixth, I to the seventh, I to the eighth. I to the ninth, I to the tenth, I to the eleventh, I to the twelfth. So every multiple of four is here. I to the eighth, I to the twelfth, I to the sixteenth. This is I, I to the fifth i to the ninth, no, not ninth, yeah, ninth. This is uh, i to the sixth, i to the seventh, i to the tenth, i to the eleventh, right? So it's one, two, th one, two, three, four, and then i to the fifth, i to the sixth, i to the seventh, i to the eighth, i to the ninth, i to the tenth, i to the eleventh, out of the 12, and you can keep going. So it literally follows the same pattern every time. The most important ones are i and i squared and a little bit of i to the fourth. But it's nice to know that every four, it repeats the pattern. It's a nice little chart to have memorized. Okay, two simple things about the properties and then we, we give you a little assignment to do. So we have a number that's partially imaginary and partially real. Right, so I'll do the imaginary part in red and the real part in blue. That's called a complex number. There's a whole series of math called complex algebra, and it's dealing with all types of numbers like this. And it's anything in the form of A, the imaginary part, plus, oh, sorry, opposite, the real part plus the imaginary part, bi, or minus. It could be either one. Right? And as we see up here, the imaginary part is the bi, and the real part is the a. Okay? 
if a is zero, so the first number is zero, right? So if I were to write something like uh, zero plus two i, that's just the same as two i, which is an imaginary number. So most of the time the zeros just dropped, it's, it's, it's included, it's inclined. Okay, so that's how we write complex numbers, a plus bi. We'll see that a little bit in the coming, I can kind of see that down here, but once we start doing uh, roots of quadratic equations, we see that. Okay, simple fact, adding all the real parts, or adding complex numbers, you add the real parts, and then you add the imaginary parts. Subtracting is the same, you subtract the imaginary parts, and you add the real parts. Okay, so very simple exercise here. We see the real parts are added. So that's an 11. Here's my imaginary parts added. And here's a negative 3 and a positive 5 plus 2i. Done. There's my answer. These two complex numbers added together, 11 plus 2i. If I do the same thing with subtraction, real minus real, 2 minus 8, well that's a negative 6, negative i minus positive 3, so negative 1 minus positive 3, that's going to give me a positive 2i. And there's my uh, complex number from there, right? So it's very simple. Real parts go together, imaginary parts go together. They cannot mix. Last two basic facts, kind of our overarching facts of addition and subtraction. Add of identity is 0 plus 0i. So if I were to add to 2 plus 3i, 0 plus 0i, that very clearly would be 2 plus 0 plus 3 plus 0. You get the same thing. The additive identity gets you itself back. And the additive inverse would get you the negative of itself. So if i, or would get you to zero, so I have to add the, the opposite of itself to get it to zero. So I would add, as it says, negative a minus or plus bi, where the b is opposite. So I literally negate both terms. The two is negated, the three is negated. If I add these, real part, real part, zero. Imaginary part, imaginary part, zero. So kind of something that's pretty nice to solve. Here it is. That's what I was looking for. There's that. All right, and just kind of a nice reminder to get us back into the idea of inverse gets us to the identity or zero. And the identity gets us, when you add it, gets us back ourselves. Come on, what's happening here? Oh, I wrote over that. Okay. So that's the last thing about complex numbers. Your assignment today is just adding and subtracting. Remember, real parts add with real parts or subtract. And then imaginary adds or subtracts with imaginary.